So up next, we have um, Greg Seipolt, who's a great customer of ours. He's actually on our customer advisory board, so we get to listen to him talk all the time and super excited you guys get to hear how smart he is. He's the director of quality engineering at Gannett, um, USA Today Network. He's also a contributor for Fixate IO and the co-founder of Quality Element. And he's responsible for uh, test automation solutions, test coverage, and continuous integration across all the US Today uh, products. So welcome up. Up here, up here. How's everybody doing? My intro was kind of already put up here, but um, I lead the quality engineering team at Gannett, but a lot of people have never really heard of Gannett, so I kind of go through the story of everybody's heard of USA Today. Um, that's our national brand. But to understand the scale that what we deal with every day from testing and you know, building stuff, is we have 109 local markets around the United States also, and you may recognize some of these you know, logos up here on this slide. Um, also a blogger, you may have seen some of my stuff on Sauce Labs, and speaking, um, I like to share my stories. I'm not, I don't know if I'm the best at it, but I try to do my best to share knowledge because I think that's how we, everybody can continue to grow. Um, if you want to get in contact with me, my information is up here, and it will be on the last side also. Um, so the agenda today is really about understanding how you set those expectations around CI and start shifting around the ownership and be in a community around CI, um, which is really important because it allows you to start focusing about building in continuous integration and shifting left, but also focusing around that single path to production. And everybody's on the same page with that. But to do all this at the scale at USA Today, we have to build a repeatable disposable infrastructure for the 110 markets. And when you have this much going on, you need those standards put in place. And then I'll also go briefly over the roles and responsibility of the quality engineering team. Every year, New Year's comes around and people make new resolutions, set goals and expectations. For 2018, my team's got big plans in the sense of continuing to rolling out a CI platform for the dev teams to improve, one, the speed, reliability, and confidence, and focus on the right levels of testing and balancing that out horizontally. But before I get started, I wanted to kind of give you the evolution of continuous integration since I started at Gannett three and a half years ago. We continue to improve every year. I gave this presentation about a year ago, and I opened my slides up roughly about a month ago, and I thought it'd be all, everything would be okay. I realized that we have evolved and continue to improve our CI platform so much in that last 12 months. And I thought that was really cool to kind of see how we have evolved and we keep introducing new things into this. Everybody's been here, manual process. It takes you know, weeks to build, test, and deploy applications. But we're not a single app. This may be easy if you have a single app. We're 110 times three for desktop, Android, iOS. That's a lot of building, testing, and deploying. And so when you have that manual process, something typically always goes wrong at the beginning, in the middle of a testing stage, you find a major bug, and that really results in the many iterations back and forth between a dev and a tester. And then in about fourth, the fifth week, you realize that now you got a release candidate. So on premise for us, we introduced automation from automated testing to continuous integration tools. Well, this allowed us to move faster and reduce some of those iterations between devs and testers, but it really wasn't enough because we now had this bottleneck of where we had some Jenkins servers in a data center or some Mac minis underneath a developer's desk and it wasn't scalable, or it may take weeks to add more hardware. 18 minutes ago, I had a vision of volunteering to take on continuous integration at Gannett. I had two interns, and I gave them this whole design, and you'll kind of see it later in the slide. They took this initiative where we built a self-service model that focused on building a repeatable, but also focusing on a disposable infrastructure in the cloud. Now, this really reduced that scalability issue we had earlier. But we was providing a service and kind of just pitching it over the wall, and that may sound very familiar to a lot of people around testing. 
Developer finishes something, they pitch over the wall, right? Well, when we just throw in the CI infrastructure for the developers, we have over 40 teams. And so what happened here is they kept falling behind because we were evolving so quickly and moving. And so two months ago, we decided to do a self-hosted CI platform. We're now going to be dedicating a CI infrastructure team to focus on helping the teams, one, coach how to build the pipelines, but maintaining that infrastructure and continue to coach and mentor these individuals to where they make sure that they're building the pipelines to have the right quality checks along the way. And I'll go into more details with this later. And we're on track to actually delivering Jenkins on Docker by in a Q1. But it really starts about what our vision really is focused around. It always requires some type of culture change. And that culture change <clears throat> really needs to embrace quality at every stage of the pipeline. And at every stage of that pipeline is even the collaboration at the very beginning. But we really believe that everyone should own quality at some level. It doesn't matter if you're just talking about a user story. But as you're, everybody's doing this, you're kind of shifting left when there's conversations. You're enabling faster feedback from testing, integrating code. But this shift is a little bit more than that. It's also about bringing the quality team into the conversation at the beginning when you're collaborating and planning for a user story and defining that acceptance criteria. This is in that discovery stage. By doing this, it's very important because now everybody kind of understands how you're going to make things, but also how we're going to be testing things. And this is going to also allow us to start thinking about and also finding problems earlier than later. But one of the key components of you know, CI success, it really is it takes a community to you know, be on the same page. And by, by creating this kind of a fostering movement, we're building and testing things to where we can focus on speed, reliability, and that consistent piece. But to have a community, it really starts by setting the expectations. By setting the expectations and clear goals up front, you're really on the right path to having a, a successful model. And we believe by starting going into 2018 is that having that dedicated team to where they're setting the expectations around delivering quality at speed, quality, we're we'll continuing to evaluate what's working and what's not working. But they need to oversee over 25 teams right now using our current infrastructure. And it's really about focus about putting the right standards out there, but also around creating guidelines and um, how-tos around how you create a pipeline. So for us, creating a pipeline is about a pipeline as code rather than just doing freestyle jobs. But focusing on continuous integration and reviewing standards and continuing to support this team where they are kind of falling over. But as we continue to foster this movement of setting expectations and helping teams, we need to continue to adapt. Every day new technologies and methods are introduced, right? And I think it's very important that we continue to evaluate new solutions. You may have found some new solution out here today from the conference. Try it out. It may work for you, but it may not. Don't be afraid to fail and move on and then continue to evaluate. I think that's really the key is you need to identify and learn from your lessons on the way. But when you find that new solution, I think it's really critical to share that information. It really starts around having a brown bag session with teams. Maybe it's an internal blog, external blog. Maybe doing a hackathon. Teach others how to do it. I think it's also in the sense of getting them familiar with a new technology maybe. But one of the things that I think we do really well with our quality engineering team and our platform team is we build self-interactive <clears throat> work like labs in the sense that it teaches you, one, how to use the new technology. 
but also we bake in our standards and all of our processes into this lab. So this is getting everybody very familiar. They're getting more comfortable. And it builds the confidence. Because now you have something, you understand what's happening. And this will just naturally happen to when you start sharing ideas with everybody. Like here, you're attending this. I'm sharing some of the thoughts of what we've been doing and what's been successful for us. So later, if you see me around or you want to hit me up and you have some ideas of how I can improve my process, I'll listen because I want to try it out and see how we can move forward. I have a very passionate quality engineering team. And that passion has really led us here today. In the three and a half years at Gannett, when I first joined, we was completely manual. And today, some of these things is just my ambition to continue to improve around CI, continuous testing. And I don't think that would have happened with, without a community. I think <clears throat> CI ownership and testing is really a community activity. It's, it's really not an individual effort. And so you'll see some dots at the very top here, and this is just a representative of all the teams that are really involved in this community. There's some others that could be involved here from designers and product owners, and you know, it just really depends, but this is where I'm focused around CI. But I think it really takes teamwork to build you know, a culture of quality. So you're, everybody's on the same page with your vision. You continue to ele elevate your ideas by having these conversations and collaborating and having those hackathons for innovation, how you can actually improve speed, how to reduce cost. And you gotta measure what's working and what's not working because not everything's gonna be perfect. But I think if you do all those things, it sets you up to, in the right path to be successful. The community really needs to be on the same state, on the same page in a sense of understanding some of the responsibilities. This is only a small subset of some of the responsibilities, but one of the things we try to do with all of our new processes, we use these dots in the sense of like, who should be brought in these conversations? So if your dot is not in a particular thing around like coaching and mentoring, it's your responsibility to ensure that you're bringing the right people into that conversation when they need to be there. We try to focus on best practices because it's very important that everybody understand what they can actually do. But the second piece, when you have 25 teams that you're supporting right now in our infrastructure, is collecting those requirements of what's working, what's not working, and what would they like to have next. There's only a single path to my house, and this is just a metaphor in a sense. You could go through the woods, walk and everything, but the most efficient way is defining a path by cutting through the woods, and that's gonna get me there the fastest way, the most efficient way, and probably the best quality way. And why I say that is you can build a CI pipeline for almost any type of application, but whether the design you're, is running on a desktop, a mobile, mobile device, or anything, the approach that you take to continuous integration needs to focus on defining that single path of production, but outlining all the stages along the way. This is only a very high level approach for this, but I think the most important piece of this actual pipeline is the infrastructure. Our platform engineering team does an excellent job in the sense of baking quality into all the self-service tools that they roll out. If they roll out a server for CentOS, they, they wanna make sure it does what it's supposed to do. Because if that fails over, that means everybody else after that is gonna be, have failure also. But as you continue to think about shifting left, it doesn't all have to be automated. The pre-commit, if you're a developer, you're a tester, run your test on your local development before even checking in code. By checking in code, you didn't run the test and someone had to review that and then they found failures, you're wasting time. It's about efficiency. Run a linter. The product stages is where you outline that stage, and this is really what's defining your continuous testing strategy. These are just very high level you know, terminology, but the commit, maybe you're running unit tests, maybe you're running integration tests, 
but maybe you also need to do some security scans. As we move forward, we're working closely with our security team to try to figure out the best quality gates that we're going to put in here. But you know, acceptance, visual testing, functional, end to end, these all can play here. But all these stages, any plan that defers testing is probably broken. To play chess, each player really needs to understand this game. But I think you need to continue to study the game and learn new strategies, tactics, continue to evolve. I feel like in chess, if you're not being proactive and you're always reacting, you're going to lose the game really quickly. I feel like testing is almost the same way. You've got to be continuing, continue to think of ahead. And by being here today and other sessions, you're getting ideas from other, other individuals around how you can improve your strategy. Because ultimately, ultimately, you want to really continue to evaluate your strategy and identify those quality gaps that you may have. So defining your continuous testing strategy, this is kind of a best practice in the sense of how we kind of approach it. And it really starts about shifting left. As you start shifting left, you're testing all, all the time, you're getting faster feedback, you're reducing that risk, right? But that builds confidence so you can release more often. But the core of this whole thing is your quality playbook. We've put together a playbook of probably about 25 different types of testing strategies or really testing types. It's your responsibility as a community to pick the right place or, and create a game plan for that user story. This is a, as you go in that conversation, you can look at your playbook and say, I need this play, this play, that play. And maybe you need to continue to adjust, like most coaches do at halftime, right? Trigger points. This is when you're firing off tests. This can be very, it can vary for everybody, but commits, creating and merging a pull request, deployments. Yes, you can test in production, it's totally fine, other companies do it. And there's different types you can do there to get some good measurements. But DevOps really plays a really key role of this. You need to ensure that you have a disposable infrastructure, automating everything, adding monitoring, blue-green deployments, canaries. You want to get feedback of how your application is reacting. And lastly, environments from your development, pre-prod, production. Testing in production, we're using synthetics, new relic synthetics, where we're firing off Selenium tests and API tests every one or three minutes or whatever to get feedback from different regions. And it's maybe not part of my CI pipeline, but we're continuously getting feedback to understand how things are reacting. The streetcars of San Francisco is a perfect example of, I think, a good architecture, simply because every time I walk around here, I feel like I'm always walk, walking uphill. And <clears throat> I don't know how, if these streetcars would have existed if they built all the city around it and thought about it later. And I think architecture is one of those things you should always think about first. Think about the infrastructure first, not later, because later it creates more maintenance, creates more time. And I think the key to that is to think of how you're going to design your architecture. If you're in the cloud, how can I make it disposable? How can I make it fast, reliable, and consistent, right? So 18 months ago, we decided to change how we build and test things. And this is where I'm going to kind of walk through some of this. It really starts at GitHub. Every commit, every merge of a PR, it's automatically getting synced to our CI servers. So it's firing off some type of quality check, right? Oh, I won't, uh, forcing everything to be pushed and retrieved to a, a centralized artifact, tree, uh, uh, artifact storage from your Docker files, NPM packages, mobile artifacts, so you can easily retrieve those. Having a dedicated uh, Kubernetes cluster for your team. We have a dedicated cluster operation team providing the service. They're kind of sizing our cluster based on the compute and everything. They're the experts of that. 
and then monitoring everything we're doing. And so each team will get their own cluster. So we can run our Jenkins Docker on it. But as we're building these containers out, we're also focusing on the future being proactive as we're moving into Kubernetes and doing something that's a little bit more native to it is Concourse, which is the icon on the bottom here for CI. <clears throat> to make that experience even easier for developers is we've built shell, a, a shell image around Jenkins for all these workers so they can scale up hundreds of workers on demand. And we can tear them right back down within minutes. But part of that process, we've also provided some light images around Node, Go, and Python, so it's easy to get up and running. But it's still the developer's responsibility to provide a container to us so we can host it for them. So they can spin up their application. Or we have one cluster running our 110 desktop. Disaster and recovery, things fail. Make sure you do a backup of your configuration. So we do nightly persistent volume snapshots of our Jenkins. If it goes down, we can easily have it back up within minutes. Our platform and engineering team builds these APIs and other tools that we can easily plug into from DN DNS management, PR management, release notes, tagging, and more. It just eases our process when we're actually trying to develop something. Lastly, testing. When we need to test from our, our desktop to our mobile web, we're using Sauce Labs so we can spin up hundreds of tests at, at once in parallel. Doing visual testing with Apple tools. We use Amazon Device Farm for all of our native testing. The unique thing with all of these is we have to test 110 markets. And from our native apps, we're doing almost 240 apps, and we're pushing those to the store. But at the end of all this execution, we want to make sure that we're pushing all these results somewhere. So we just started using QA Symphony and trying to use their insights by pushing all the different types of tests into their insights dashboard to give us visualization into the health of the project. In all this, we're wrapping New Relic to monitor everything. So if we're seeing something as we're bursting out and something's not working, we can work with our cluster ops team or our platform engineering team. You ever go hiking and you come across this sign that says, please stay on the trail? There's probably a reason why they put this sign up. But unless you like to adventure off the trail, it's probably best to stay on that trail, right? Well, I think continuous integration needs to have standards. I think it's very important, but I think everyday life, there's reasons why we have standards and rules and we should follow those. What, what would happen if we didn't have clear defined standards? I think the whole, impro the whole process would be a complete mess. You always have that one individual, if you don't have a standard, they'll go do their own thing, create their own rules. And to put it in more perspective, you imagine if you had one driver that thought a stop sign was optional? It's a simple rule, but if you had that one, that would create a mess. It would cost a lot of money, maybe some lives. I know that's hard to compare to this presentation, but there's a reason why you have rules and standards around things. And especially for us, we have multiple teams, 25 plus teams using our current infrastructure using uh, Chef, uh, Jenkins Chef. And that's why it's so critical that they, everybody's on the same page and understand our standards. And it really starts with good documentation and educating those teams based on conversations like today. Let's walk through some of our standards. <clears throat> We require teams to use a Jenkins file, pipeline as code, because this is kind of your backup. If your server goes down, this file exists inside your repo. It'll be easy to retrieve. We're building templates, and in the next slide you'll see some of it and I'll go through it, but we're building templates to help the teams understand how to build those pipelines. Because 
before when I was talking about the self-service, when we gave them the freedom to create the pipelines code, it's like you gotta treat it like a you know a coding project because people just do all kinds of crazy things with their code. Um, you know, ensure that we're pushing and retrieving from artifactories a central hub of all of our artifacts so people know where to go if they need to repro reproduce something. Using Slack for notifications. Why do I need a standard around this? Because if you're sending too much information to a channel or an individual, they'll just mute the channel. Then there's no value in it. We wanted to try to provide good value around what we're actually sending out about the pipeline. The dedicated cluster ops team, where they're constantly monitoring our infrastructure. Those backups, we do them every night. We hold up to about 90 days worth for compliance reasons. Shared libraries, this is a custom DSL to where we can easily use <clears throat> those existing APIs or if we wanna build our own tools where we're pushing stuff to Artifactory. We're trying to simplify it as you're building out your pipeline as code to where you're just calling this simple, AP, this simple shared library DSL rather than trying to learn the whole API yourself. Continue to monitor everything. We've baked this instantly into everything we do. So we can go into a new dashboard and understand how our whole infrastructure is working. Helping teams move to containers. We're been really heavy with Chef and now we're moving to Docker. And when my team will be helping those individuals. Webhooks, so we can automatically sync up and do in testing. Managing secrets, it's amazing how often people will actually push API keys to a GitHub repo. So we're trying to bake in HashiCorp's <clears throat> vault into even our testing frameworks when we're even going from Sauce Labs to Apple Tools. So it'll be, everything will be a little bit more secure and you're not pushing things. Pushing those results to an Insight dashboard to have real-time feedback on your actual project. And many more, and you can hit me up and I can give you more of some of our standards. <clears throat> this is gonna be scrolling, it'll go really quick and sorry if it's going so quick and you wanna see it, but this is just a template that we provide our developers around how to write a Jenkins file for Node.js. But I think it's important to understand some of these basic pipeline terms. From an agent to a staging and stages. But I think the most important one we really use in the testing side of it is the parallel piece. It's when you wanna burst out multiple levels of testing at the exact same time. I can run it across multiple different types of containers. So if I want to run my functional test, visual test, and everything, and our whole SLA is to be less than five minutes, which all of our UI testing today is less than five minutes. That's our SLA in the sense of our service level agreement. Developers and my quality engineering team is responsible of writing this pipeline as code. We use Nightwatch and we use some other variations of you know, front end testing. We're building our own Jenkins file inside our repos too. It's not the developer's responsibility. They don't know typically how to run this. So we're providing that guidance for them. You ever get a new puppy? Yes, no. Lots of responsibility, right? This puppy depends on you so much the first day from love, food, showing him where to go to the restroom, right? It's almost very similar to the old methodology of testing, where the product owners and the developers really depend on you for everything, finding all the defects. But I think as we continue to evolve and move forward, I think it's our responsibility to coach and mentor everyone what quality we need and how to bake it in through the whole continuous integration pipeline. And I think that's the responsibility is what my team focuses on, because what we're trying to do is create a, cult a culture of quality where everybody's thinking about how we can continue to improve. And we need to be the voice of quality and continuous integration. I lead four teams today. The quality specialist team, SDS that are embedded in all the product teams, 
that red one, the continuous <clears throat> integration operations where they're really just focused on helping teams deliver code faster. And a test infrastructure team, which is always evaluating, meeting with teams, collecting requirements, and understanding if we need to build new tools or improve new tools. We need to continue to evangelize how we are testing things, making it very clear, monitoring those results, what tests are failing. We've heard a lot about flake. We don't have much flake, but when we do, we really need to evaluate it. But also, identifying those quality gaps. We all have them, and typically it's always in production. As we just went through the whole big Olympics, we went through a lot of testing. And then we hit some performance hits. When, you know, Sean Waite busts out on 9.7, everybody wants to go check the results. And we find a gap that we don't do, we, we just miss something, and we need to recalibrate for that. And I think that's our responsibility, but it's everybody on the team's responsibility. This is my time. Thank you um, for having me today. And I have roughly a few minutes for questions. Um, what, what do you find is the most effective way to evangelize to the rest of the company? Because one of the things, I mean, we find that um, as we're going left and we're, we're encouraging people to use the test frameworks and stuff, there's some teams, yep, yeah, they get it, they, they're really into hearing everything that we have to propose to them, and then there's others that we've published this information, we've provided it for them, but it's almost like the first time they're like, oh, I didn't know it existed, and things like that. What do you find is the best way to kind of go about get Things Evangelizing it? Yeah, and all um, that stuff. So when I first joined, our Android team has really been my blueprint of doing everything. Um, they always kind of just like, ah, I don't know if we should do this. And I just would go out and do it and then show them proof by sharing some of the success stories that we had doing moving to. So like what I said, 18 months ago, I took Android of running on some Mac minis, and completely everything was running in the cloud. And we was building 110 markets in less than an hour. Um, and so some of that is we do a lot of internal blogging. We do some hackathons and sharing that knowledge and then also trying to get other people to kind of hype things up, right? I mean, everybody gets excited when they see something actually working. And, um, and so it's sharing those stories is what's really been working for us. Uh, you know, just recently, we moved our 110 apps to Google AMP for the mobile, you know, mobile web experience. And, we really changed around how we approached that project completely by really spending a lot of time up front around the collaboration and planning. So when we actually, the developers started writing the code for Google AMP, we already had pseudo code ready for the UI test. And it only took us minutes to really like tweak them a little bit. And that was really just, you know, we took an idea and so now we're trying to now share that with others. And I think the biggest thing is just sharing information. And when you have a success story, bringing people in and showing that. It's, it, it's a difficult, because you're going to always have people that's going to resi resist certain things. Hi, it's really impressive to see how many things you do. Uh, you have all this market, so you have probably millions of people using your sites and apps. And you like, seems like you automated everything, but do you do anything in terms of automating for accessibility? It's like for vision impaired people or people with like moderate disability, stuff like this. Thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, it's never been one of our responsibility, and it's interesting because um, I've been part of one of those projects, and if you attended Ashley's, I worked with Ashley for about 10 years before leaving Blackboard. And um, I worked on a project around accessibility for about a year. And um, there was various tools that we were using in the sense of around, um, I can't remember exactly, it was an IBM tool. And we was using that to kind of build in accessibility around making sure that we had all the right alt text and stuff like that. But that only gets you so far. You really, because it's about the workflow of jumping around the page. And um, I think there it's about having an industry standard, I think we had an advantage where we actually had a professor that was blind and he was providing guidances like, it took me three tabs to get to this certain area. Um, 
so right now, one of the things we're using is test Leo to kind of do some evaluation from an exploratory around accessibility. Um, they're kind of like a applause, and, um, but we don't have any automation around that because it hasn't been part of our standard. But I can, you know, later we can have a conversation that I can have ideas or introduce to Ashley because Ashley would have some good ideas. All right, sorry, we're out of time. All right, thank you.